Signore e signori, buonasera. Welcome to New York University, Casa Italiana, Zerilli Marimò, for this evening that we wanted to dedicate to Angelo Del Boca. And I don't think we have ever done anything of this kind, like an evening dedicated to remembering uh, the career, the life, the scholarship of one singular individual. And I'm very happy that we picked Angelo Del Boca to start with this. And when he died in 2021, uh, with my colleagues, and I have the fortune of working with two historians in the Department of Italian Studies here, David Forgash and Ruth Ben-Ghiat. We talked about it, also for the personal connections that we have with his daughter, Daniela Del Boca, an economist who is a frequent um, visiting professor here at New York University, uh, about the legacy, what Angelo Del Boca meant. And uh, we thought that it would be important to share with our American friends the role that this person played in Italian contemporary history, both for his personal history, he was a partisan, a freedom fighter against fascism, and he wrote a diary uh, about that. And he was an investigative journalist of the kind that is not common to find in Italy, and an historian, but that came to history through investigative journalism. My colleagues are going to examine different parts of his scholarship, of his writings, uh, but I would say that probably in the collective imagination of, of many people, he is indelibly uh, the person that represents the end of the myth of Italiani brava gente. As you know, there was this uh, expression that meant basically that Italians went to war, but yes, they were not as bad as the others, right? They went to uh, the colonies, they had colonies, but they did not fight as bad as the other. The other were the bad guys, and the Italians, after all, remained brava gente. Well, Angelo Del Boca debunked that myth, and I think the depth of gratitude that, as Italians, we should have towards him has exactly to do with that. And somebody could say, well, you know, he presents the Italian in, in a negative way. No, that's not... The purpose of Del Boca, that's not the ultimate result of his research, but it's really to providing an historical truth that is accurate, based on documents, and that love doesn't leave any space to easy justifications. And I would say that one of the problems of Italy with its historical past is that very often it didn't come to terms with it. It didn't come to terms with fascism, it didn't come to terms with any other, many other a historical phenomena that happened. And the fact that somebody like Del Boca, in a moment that was very difficult when he started this research, where everybody was against the military leadership, the political class, the great majority of Italian journalism, and he continued deliberately in his way, looking for documents, finding the documents, making them public, connecting them to create the real history of what happened. So for this intellectual honesty, for this uh, capacity to really um, bring history as an element that builds the identity of a nation, but not based on, on, on myths and on lies, but on the truth, we owe him a debt of gratitude. And I think we are here to celebrate first and foremost that historian, that journalist, that really gave us back the truth about what Italians did. And um, to talk about um, Angelo Del Boca, we have here tonight uh, three historians. I mentioned Ruth ben uh, who is a professor of history and Italian studies here at New York University. You probably know and are familiar with her, also because of her frequent contributions to CNN and many other uh, news uh, outlets. Especially in the last few years, Ruth has been a familiar face. Uh, she's normally called to be the authority on what is fascism and how you can use that word and apply that word in context different from the historical context of fascism. And she always does a brilliant job uh, in, in explaining with great clarity that. Um, and her last book is about the strong man. Uh, it's a book that uh, raised a lot of uh, dialogue and discussions. And she analyzes the different kinds of, uh, of, of, uh, of strong men throughout history and the common elements that they have. Um, then we have David Forgash with us, who is currently the chair of the Department of Italian Studies here at New York University. Um, David's interest, David also is an historian, an historian of culture, um, 
is in contemporary Italy. His latest book is on messaggi di violenza. It's on the, the meaning and the messages that political violence played in uh, modern and contemporary uh, Italian history. And we have Silvana, uh, Silvana Patriarca, Fordham University. Thank you very much, Silvana, for being here with us. And uh, uh, Silvana is also a contemporary historian with a strong interest in Italy. Uh, her main interest is in the um, colonial history of Italy and the multiracial composition of Italy and how it arrived to that and what are the issues and the problems connected to, the, to, these, to these issues. She has been a frequent guest on our stage here at Casa Italiana, and we are very, very grateful that she's here with us tonight. We also have a special guest, who is the, uh, Daniela Del Boc, as I mentioned. Daniela is an economist at the Collegio Carlo Alberto in Turin, and uh, she's a good friend of the Casa and of New York University, also for family reasons, and uh, we are delighted to have this panel. So the first one to speak is going to be Silvana, and so I, I'm asking you to please welcome Silvana Patriarca. Thank you. So good evening, and um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ruth Benghiat and uh, the Casa Italiano NYU for the invitation to speak at this event celebrating the life and work of Angelo Del Boca. I'm very pleased and honored to, uh, to be here because Angelo was not only an extremely important contributor, and in fact, the initiator of post-45 Italy, in post-45 Italy of what I would call the decolonization of the history of Italian colonialism. But he was also an exemplary public intellectual, engaged and committed to the values of anti-fascism, values that, as we all know, have come under attack in Italy in the past 30 years particularly. In the few minutes that I have, um, I cannot do justice uh, to the vast bibliography of Angelo Del Boca, who was uh, a, a journalist, a historian, a novelist, uh, and wrote um, a lot, many books. Uh, but I will mention a few significant titles and how they relate to uh, a major defining event in his biography namely his militancy in the Italian resistance in 1944 and 1945. Before the first volume of his comprehensive history of Italian colonialism in the Horn of Africa appeared in 1976, he had written actually a shorter book before on the uh, war in Ethiopia. Italian academic historians, with very few exceptions, had virtually ignored the history of Italian colonialism. For many years, as Del Boca himself pointed out, in the 50s and 60s, a group of former colonial administrators and pro-colonial scholars had assembled a mystifying collection of documents which presented Italian colonialism in a purely positive light and also made it difficult uh, the access to the archives to other scholars. Del Boca's work, uh, work uh, set the colonial record straight, bringing whenever possible the voices of the colonized into the story. Beside the fundamental, his fundamental work on the history of colonialism in the Horn of Africa, and here you can see uh, some of the uh, um, the four volumes, the covers of the four volumes. He also wrote two volumes on Italian colonialism and post-colonialism in, Afri in um, uh, Libya. Let me stress how much uh, substantial research against the grain he had to do to write the six volumes that make this comprehensive history of Italian colonialism, and also how legible they were so in contrast to 
uh, the often uh, unreadable academic prose uh, uh, of Italian um, uh, historians. <laughs> These were actually books that people, ordinary people, could read and could learn from. In his historical works and journalism, Angelo relentlessly denounced the misdeeds and the violence of Italians in Africa, demolishing, as uh, uh, Stefano has already uh, reminded us, the myth of the Italians as good colonialists. Probably all colonialists think they are, they are special, they are good. But the Italians thought uh, that they were good in a particular strong way. And, and this myth um, is, of course, uh, became hegemonic and uh, had a self-absolutory function in post-fascist Italy. Uh, and it's not yet dead uh, among the general public in spite of much more work that has been done on colonialism in the past. A uh, few uh, years, and it belongs. It's a myth that belongs uh, in uh, the cliche uh, of Italian national character. Many Italians did not um, want to hear the inconvenient truth of Italian colonialism, its violence in particular, and its racism. Not by chance, the title of the first edition of Angela Del Bocca's aut autobiography. You can see it here. Um, which he published in 2000, was a testimony scomodo, an, an inconvenient witness, we could say. Right? Um, and truly, Angelos was an inconvenient witness because as a journalist and as a historian, he was never afraid to say what many people didn't want to hear and didn't want to recognize. Memorable was the polemical exchange which he had with the most influential conservative opinion maker of the First Republic and a former fascist who had uh, been in Ethiopia during the aggression, Indro Montanelli, who stubbornly denied for years and years that Mussolini had used gas during the aggression to Ethiopia. Uh, Montanelli based uh, this assertion on the fact that he was in Ethiopia at the time, as if one's person's testimony was the definitive evidence of what had or had not happened. He changed his mind only when, in 1996, eventually, the Italian Minister of Defense recognized that the army, the Italian army in Ethiopia, used mustard gas in the aggression. Angelo's interest in doing research on African societies and colonial history originated from his activity as a journalist, which he undertook after the end of the war. As a journalist, he was sent to cover many important events in a period in which new African countries were being created after World War II in the struggle against colonialism. He was in Algeria during the War of Independence, he went to India, to Iran, to Congo, and to many other places. He was also uh, present at the Heichmann trial in Jerusalem. As he tells us in his memoirs, his interest in doing historical research on colonialism came also from the casual discovery he made of, uh, he made of one of his high school's notebooks, which collected the news on the war in Ethiopia, which were dictated by one of his professors, uh, to which he had added various uh, uh, newspaper clips. So this actually generated right, an interest and also an emotion in him, right, this memory. But Angelo's sensitivity towards the anti-colonial struggles, his sympathy and solidarity towards the people of the new states uh, built on the ruins of the colonial world was not simply a product of his travels to cover events in these countries as a journalist, but sprang also from his sense of what is just and what is uh, right and what is wrong, and from his own experience as a partisan in a justice and liberty formation in the Second World War. Uh, justice and Liberty uh, was the anti-fascist organization established by liberal socialist Carlo Rosselli in Paris in 1929. Uh, which was a very important component of the resistance, along with uh, uh, the communist brigades 
and uh, other, other formation, Catholic formations. After the armistice between Italy and the Allies in September 1943, at the age of 18, he was born in 1925, Angelo was forced into the army of the Fascist Republic of Salon and was sent to Germany to be trained as a soldier. After he returned to Italy in the summer of 1944, when he was sent to fight on the Apennines, so the fight to the partisans on the Apennines uh, in the Salo army, he decided to join the partisans. So he decided to desert with several other uh, members of his uh, uh, division. And uh, um, so he joined uh, a partisan group that was fighting on the Apennine Mountains near Piacenza in the southwest corner of Emilia Romagna. Having been born and having grown up under fascism, the choice uh, of joining the partisans was the real, was the real first uh, choice, or, or the first real choice, to be more precise, that he made, as he says in his memoirs. So the first, we could say, the first uh, act of freedom, of real freedom in his life. La Scelta, the choice is indeed the title of the book, which he first published with Feltrinelli in 1963. And it's important to remember, as he tells us also in the introduction to this book, that he wrote this uh, between 1960 and 1961 in a dramatic moment in the history of post-war Italy, uh, when uh, the uh, neo-fascist party was supporting, actually, a democratic, a, a Christian democratic-led government. So this was Governo Tambroni, which is well known for having uh, killed many people who demonstrated against this kind of you know, participation of a neo-fascist party in a, in a government, although not you know, from a support, from an external support position, but also the, the very sort of law and order, you know, direction that the government was taking. So um, the narrative in La Scelta was in part based on a diary that he had kept in, uh, you know, when he came, when he came back from uh, Germany uh, and then joined the partisans. A diary that he uh, published in uh, 2015 uh, with the title Nella Notte ci guidano le stelle, the stars are leading us in the night, a line from a famous resistance song. Uh, the diary is a vivid document of a young man who is trying to find a language to talk about the hardship, but also the elation of being involved in that war. Angel also wrote in the history of the resistance, and in particular in the experience of the Partisan Republic of Ossola in northern Piedmont, uh, an important, although very brief, experience of self-government in an area liberated from the Nazi fascist between September and October 1944. Angelo's families, by the way, had, been, uh, had lived uh, for a few years in that area. And in this regard, we should also recall his work as president of the Istituto Storico della Resistenza in Piacenza and director of its journal, Studi Piacentini, which was later renamed uh, Sentieri della Ricerca, a journal that under his direction published studies not only on the local history of fascism and the resistance, but grew to cover historical subjects of more general relevance, such as the history of colonialism, the history of Africa, and the history of racism. In 2006, Angelo proposed the establishment of uh, a day to remember the victims of colonialism, and after 16 years, it looks like finally the City Council of Rome is going to act on this proposal. Uh, the date chosen for the remembrance is February the 19th, the day when a ferocious reprisal was unleashed on the Ethiopians after the attempted assassination of Marshal Graziani, who came to be known as the Butcher of Ethiopia. Uh, the Rome Council also intends to modify the name tags of those streets in Rome that commemorate a place or an individual linked uh, to colonialism by adding some information for the public about the atrocities committed by the Italians in Africa.
These are small but important symbolic acts that could help Italians to get to know the actual nature of colonialism and their full history. More uh, work needs to be done, certainly, to bring the history of his dark past to, to impact on the Italian self-understanding. But Angelo del Bocca's work first indicated the way. He was a generous and engaged public intellectual and an example of commitment and integrity for us all. And this is particularly relevant, I think, today when the Prime Minister of Italy is the leader of a so-called post-fascist party with historical links to neo-fascism and its nationalist and exclusionarist culture. And I want to end by, I want to conclude by reading a passage from um, the novel La Scelta, which I mentioned before, because it's actually it's linking the, the present moment to that other dramatic moment in the history of post-war Italy. Uh, these are the words that he uh, makes uh, uh, one of the protagonists of this uh, uh, book to uh, say in, um, in front of an, another group of partisans who met during, uh, right, in uh, 1960, uh, at the time, of course, of the Tambroni crisis. I'm reading it in Italian, and uh, do I need to translate it also, or everybody understands it? I'll read it in Italian first, and then I'll translate it briefly. Hanno scelto, hanno scelto la resistenza, questo muro antifascista che si ricostituisce miracolosamente ogni volta che si profila un rischio totalitario e l'indebolimento della tutela costituzionale. So they, sh they chose the resistance, uh, this wall, uh, this anti-fascist wall, which is uh, miraculous, re uh, which is uh, reconstituting itself miraculously every time that uh, a, a totalitarian risk uh, comes to the fore and there is a, a weakening of uh, uh, the constitution. Un fronte che unisce gli uomini liberi al di sopra dei partiti e che si delinea sempre di più come una forza anticonformista che non tollera lo stato di polizia e lo stato censore, lo stato del privilegio e lo stato dell'ipocrisia. So this is a front of free men, we could say and women too today, uh, on, uh, above the parties, uh, which is uh, uh, more and more a, a front of, um, uh, a force of people who are against uh, conform conformism, which do not tolerate uh, a police state or a police based on censorship, a, a, state, ba a state based on censorship, a state uh, based on privilege and on hypocrisy. Um, and then he says, uh, uh, continuing, non è colpa mia se hanno rimesso a nuovo il fascismo, se l'hanno riportato al governo, e noi ci troviamo più o meno come tu dici con le stesse beghe di 40 anni fa. Ma poiché questa è la realtà, io che ho scelto non per un giorno, devo continuare a rimanere sulla barricata per difendere le istituzioni democratiche che abbiamo dato al Paese, i miei ricordi e i miei morti. So he says, um, it's not my fault if they, if they put, to, uh, put fascism against in government. Um, and, and we find ourselves again with similar problems that we had many uh, decades ago. But because this is the reality, um, myself, I, who, have not, who has not uh, made a choice just for a day, but for life, I need to continue to be on the barricades to defend the democratic institutions which we gave to the country, my memories, and my dad. Thank you for your attention. Um, thanks, Sylvan. It's going to be hard <laughs> to say anything too new since you covered everything there. Um, but I think the way we decided to break this up is that, how do I get out of this? Um, and sure. Okay, here's my one. Oh, isn't it? I don't like these windows that do this. Okay, there we go. Um,
Um, yeah. The way that uh, Silvana, Ruth, and I decided to break this up is that uh, Silvana will give an overview. Um, Ruth will focus, I think, on the work of, on colonialism, and is that right, colonial history? And I will fill in what, to me, which Silvana's already talked about, which is a very important phase of uh, Angelo Del Bocco's career. Uh, he was a writer, but I think I would say he was two kinds of writers. Uh, from 1950 to 1981, he was a professional journalist, a full-time journalist. Uh, working on two different newspapers from 1950 to 1967. He was a journalist on the um, Turin Torino newspaper, uh, La Gazzetta del Popolo, the, the second newspaper of Torino after La Stampa. Um, I mean, actually, it was the first, it was the, had the highest circulation in La Stampa in the 1930s, but then after 1945, it, circulation uh, decreased. Uh, then he took a kind of sabbatical year to write a a critical book about the Italian press, um, actually, and also the international press, in, which came out in 1968. And then from 68 to 81, he was a journalist um, on uh, another newspaper, La Nazione, which was the paper, sorry, Il Giorno, Il Giorno, the paper founded by Enrico Mattei. So um, 30 years as a journalist, over 30 years, right, 1950 to 1981. He started, in other words, when he was 25, because he was born in 1925, and he finished when he was 56. And in that, then his second career has already taken off. He hated uh, working for uh, Il Giorno. He said it was a really bad move. He didn't like living in Milan. He missed Torino. <laughs> uh, uh, also, his wife became seriously ill in 1974. She had meningitis. She died in 1979. This was a terrible tragedy. Um, so, you know, in, it was kind of another reason really to leave Milan and to go back to Torino. Uh, already in the 70s, he was career as a, this second career as a writer of historical books was taking off. He had a contract with La Terza to write that series of books on um, Italian colonial history that uh, Silvan has talked about. Those books started selling pretty well. Um, and he realized that what he really wanted to do was do, to be a historian. Plus, you know, working as a journalist was very difficult to do, to travel, to do the kind of in-depth research on archives you needed to do as a historian. So in a sense, he kind of switched careers. He was always a writer, but then he became a different kind of writer after 1981. Um, and... Um, I just want to say a little bit about that journalistic career that Silvanus sketched in. He was an in, uh, um, was it called a special correspondent? Um, what do they call it? Inviato speciale? Yeah, special correspondent on like Gazelle Popolo, and he travelled extensively. I think as Silvana mentioned, 1957, he spent several months in India, and he went to Iran, and he went to Israel. Um, and he wrote a book about the first 10 years of the state of Israel from 48 to 58, which came out in 1958. I'm going to say a word about that book in a minute. Um, then he went, did this long 59, a series of uh, visits to different African countries, um, Mauritania, Senegal, Congo, Guinea, uh, Liberia, Ivory Coast, Ghana, Nigeria, Cameroon, I left any out, Gabon, right? And he said actually in his... Um, in Il Mio Novecento, which is this wonderful um, kind of autobiography, but it's not really an autobiography because what he does is he sort of sticks in little examples of his writing. So he tells us a bit of narrative and then he inserts text from that earlier period. So it's a very exciting text to read. And he says about that uh, visit to African countries in 1959, fu un viaggio di estrema importanza per la mia formazione di africanista. He met people, he met uh, uh, revolutionaries, he met people sort of starting to form these new African states. It was a really important learning experience. In 1965, he went for the first time to Ethiopia, and he wrote a series of articles, already still a journalist, about the Italo-Ethiopian War, the 1935-36 war, on the occasion, of course, of the 30th anniversary of the invasion. So he wrote this book in 65, but it was commemorating uh, 1935. And this became his first book on the subject. Um, and that's the original cover of it. And it came out in, uh, in Italian in uh, 65, and then it came out in uh, an English translation, a good English translation in 69. Uh, now, I'm not going to say anything about this, pretty much, because my two colleagues are both covering it. Ruth's, Ruth's going to say much more about this work. But I just wanted to talk about the genesis of all this as a piece of journalism. Um, Giorgio Vecchiato, who was then the editor of the Gazzetta del Popolo, he liked uh, Del Bocca's idea of going to Ethiopia. And he said, just take as much time as you like. Just, I mean, <laughs> newspaper editors don't do this anymore. Uh, he said, just spend as long as you can and you know, do a really good piece of research. Um, and that, that is the book in which, for the first time, he talks about the use of mustard gas. Uh, of Eperite, 
um, which of course was prohibited by the Geneva Protocols of 1920, well passed in 25, actually came into force in 2028, 20, and Italy had signed that protocol. So Italy had actually signed up to not use um, uh, poison gas. Um, and in that book, Del Bocca's two telegrams, uh, he later finds many more confirming Mussolini's direct orders to Badoglio and Graziani to use gas. Um, and uh, it's also the first book in which he talks about the violent repressions uh, ordered by Graziani, the Yekatit 12 massacre, which, the massacre of February 19th to 21st, 1937, which Silvan has mentioned, the subsequent executions of a number of monks and deacons in the monastery of Debre Libanos uh, in May of 1937. Um, and it's actually worth noting, and I think, and this is interesting in light of the late, later kind of controversy with Indra Montanelli, that he says there, uh, Tuttavia, anche in pieno conflitto, i nostri avversari seppero fare le dovute distinzioni fra gli elementi fanatici del regime e la grande massa dei nostri soldati, che si comportò umanamente con le popolazioni, chi ignorò persino l'impiego del gas e che ancora oggi, per motivi che si possono capire, lo pone in dubbio. And he wrote that in 1965. And actually, I should also mention, he does balance out this picture by mentioning the atrocities perpetrated by the British Army after the liberation, uh, particularly in the uh, Ogaden region uh, near the border with Somalia when they uh, massacred people uh, when that region came under their control. Um, but it was a different book. It was this book, which was w when I first encountered the other Del Boca, the Del Boca journalist. Um, it was in 2008, so uh, what's that, 14 years ago? Uh, when I was working on the chapter on asylums uh, for my book, Italy's Margins, which came out in 2014. Uh, and this is a book he published in 1966. Um, and like all the books from this period, it's actually uh, just a write-up of a series of articles that he'd written for La Gazzetta del Popolo. Um, and it'd actually been republished, it'd been syndicated to four other newspapers uh, in Bologna, Florence, Bari, and Palermo. Uh, and this is a really important book because it was the first um, sustained criticism, I think I've never found anything earlier than this, um, by a, a, a journalist who really done the research. The first sustained criticism in Italy of the asylum system, the system of uh, what were called at the time in, in, um, in the United States insane asylums, um, which in Italian are called manicomi. Uh, which were euphemistically called psychiatric hospitals, ospedali psichiatrici, but all the um, radical psychiatrists who tried to uh, abolish this system, the best known was, of course, Franco Basaglia, said it should actually be called manicomi because what they are, they're, they're basically psychiatric prisons, um, and they are places of extreme uh, degradation. And Angelo de Bocca um, starts this book by quoting a speech from the uh, socialist health minister of the time in September 1965, Luigi Mariotti. He's an important figure in this story, actually. He, the, the law of 1978, the so-called Basaglia law, is very well known, the one that actually led to the closure of the manicomi in Italy, but it was Luigi Mariotti who first started the ball rolling in 68 with an important reform, uh, which actually made the system, we were starting transitioning to the closure already. And of course, 68 was the year that Basaglia's book, uh, L'Istituzione Negata, came out, the really important kind of manifesto of closing the, um, the manicomi. Um, and uh, in, this, in this speech that he made in 1965, which Del Bocca quotes at the beginning of this book, uh, uh, Mariotti um, said, states, if I can just find the page here, um, a speech he gave at the Cinema Odeon in Milan, uh, he said, esistono ospedali psichiatrici dove il medico la mattina va a sentire della suora se c'è qualcosa di nuovo e poi sparisce. Abbiamo oggi degli ospedali che somigliano a veri e propri laga germanici, a delle vere e proprie bolge dantesche. I malati di mente, secondo la vecchia legge del 1904, sono considerati uomini irrecuperabili e sono anche schedati, secondo un principio medioevale nel casellario giudiziario presso il tribunale. Um, so, you know, these people are prisoners. Um, they get into psychiatric, into these uh, institutions for all sorts of reasons. The family members don't want them. Uh, a, a teenage girl shows uh, pre you know, precocious sexual desire and her parents think she's mad in a Catholic family and get her shut away in a manicomio. And um, Del Bocco really was the first to document all this in, 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 in an important way. T to me, it's interesting, this connection that he made between the Nazi camps and the mental asylums that, Del that uh, Mariotti makes and then he remakes and puts on the title is so interesting to me. Um, this wasn't just him that did this. This was really becoming, in some ways, a, a, a kind of a topos, a sort of repeated theme of 
work by radical psychiatrists and journalists who would denounce the institution. These essentially are lager, they are concentration camps. Um, so, um, the, the, if you see on that cover there, and one of the people quoted is Georges Domaison. Uh, Domaison was a French psychiatrist. He was one of the left-wing psychiatrists who formed a, a group in Paris uh, that started denouncing these institutions and said they needed to be reformed and humanized. Um, and in 1945, they organized two days of discussions at the saint Anne Psychiatric Hospital in Paris, which also linked uh, hosp these hospitals to the so-called hospitals to the um, concentration camp system. Um, and this actually wasn't just a matter of similarity. As Domaison and others pointed out, under the Vichy regime, the Nazis, uh, the so-called euthanasia program, which was this kind of, um, um, how would you sort of dress rehearsal for the Holocaust, uh, where they exterminated, they killed um, people who were in these long-stay um, psychiatric institutions um, because they were considered what they called life unworthy of life, Lebens und Wertes Leben. That had been extended to occupied France. Um, so uh, and they said an estimated 40,000 patients in French mental hospitals had been deliberately left to die of exposure or starvation uh, when uh, under the Vichy system. So um, this became also a theme in American campaign. This is an article from Life in 1946. Um, and again, uh, we find the same comparison. Uh, these are places that are like the concentration camps. And of course, it was Life magazine, which in 1945 had carried the photographs, the first photographs of the liberated camps. This is the famous uh, reportage done by George Roger in Belson in 45. Uh, I mean, there's some horrible pictures, which I think it's really not appropriate to show. But the point is, he wanted to show the emaciated people in rags um, who'd been left um, after the, the Nazis um, uh, went away from the camps. And these photographs, which are trying to make that connection, And it's interesting to me that Del Boca's book doesn't actually have any photographs, even though he was a good photojournalist. He often carried a camera. Uh, he was encouraged by La Gazette del Popolo to take photographs, but this does, doesn't have photographs, apart from these three on the cover. Um, but it's actually interesting here that the ones he chooses to, sh to, chooses to show are these ones of people in these degrading uh, kind of prison outfits. Uh, and he says here, and another thing I want to quote from this because it's so interesting, um, he says, il fatto che maggiormente traumatizza gli ammalati è l'obbligo di indossare l'uniforme, spesso rappresentata da autentici cenci di un colore indefinibile. Ha scritto a questo riguardo una paziente, this is a woman uh, patient writing to him, il solo fatto di dare ad una donna un abito sgualcito, senza bottoni, troppo lungo, troppo corto, senza che possa farci nulla per porvi rimedio, contribuisce ad aumentare in essa quello stato d'animo fatto di menefreghismo, di trascuratezza, di malumore e di miseria che tende ad, am ad aumentare il suo complesso di inferiorità. So putting somebody in a shabby rag is one way of degrading them. And this also connects with I mean, two other very famous books which both came out in 1961, Irving Goffman's book Asylums and uh, Michel Foucault's uh, Madness and Civilization. Um, uh, La Folie des Raisons, uh, as it was called in the original title, which both had a, were a critique, a sustained critique of this system. Okay, having discovered this, uh, this book, I then wanted to discover the other things that Del Bocca had written in the 1960s. Um, and I haven't really got time to say much about all of them. I just wanted to talk about two or three that I thought particularly meaningful because they connect to this theme of kind of Holocaust memory. Um, when he went to Israel in uh, 1958, beginning of 1958, um, this book accounts, starts with his um, account of his visit to Lohame Chagetot, which is the kibbutz that was set up by the survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto, um, um, the, the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Uh, and it housed what is called the Ghetto Fighters House. It actually was the first Holocaust museum, really, in the world. Um, its full name is the Itzhak Katzen Nelson Holocaust and Jewish Resistance Heritage Museum, Documentation and Study Center. And it was there that he saw for the first time these photographs. I mean, there had, of course, been other photographs. There'd been the George Roger reportage. Um, uh, Alain René's film, Night and Fog, had already come out in 1955. So this wasn't the first time, but it was the first time that he said this really made an impact on him, seeing what had happened in those, in those death camps. 
Um, and as he listens to the voice of the guide, this is a woman called Miriam Novich, he inserts sections of text into which he recalls his own personal encounter with anti-Semitism. And I, I found this so interesting. He says, look, I was a young man. I grew up in fascist Italy. I was, you know, Balila, and I was kind of brought up in that culture. And I remember that um, when the teacher came into our school in 1938, said there's been this new law passed where the Jews are now, um, you know, persona non grata, he said, it didn't really mean very much to me. You know, I had one Jewish friend in the school. His father was high up. Uh, you know, he thought this isn't really going to affect him, and it didn't mean a lot to him. And then he tells another story of how when he was in Germany, when he was in the, um, uh, you know, the Alpino, and he was then in, was conscripted in the Solo Republic Army, and he went to a good training in Germany, he actually saw at a station um, a group of um, Jewish civilians were being deported to a camp. And the Nazi soldiers were laughing about it and joking about it. And he said, I felt kind of uncomfortable, but what I also thought was kind of relief that I'm not them. So he's incredibly honest at giving that testimony that, you know, he wasn't anti-Semitic, but he was in some ways, he didn't feel personally involved. This trip to Israel and to that center was really um, a kind of turning point for him, I think. Um, and he's, it, you know, meant that the account is generally sympathetic to the Israelis. I mean, it, it said, you know, they needed a state, they had a right to do this and so on. And he said afterwards in Il Mio Novecento, his memoir, he said, I was perhaps, you know, too generous, you know, I didn't really kind of give enough account to the Palestinians who'd been displaced and I didn't really balance the story out. And if I were to write that book now, I'd write it differently. But the point is that book in 1958 is a record of how he felt at the time. And I think that's why it's such an interesting, interesting book. Um, so um, the other thing is that he went in, in, this is the other connection with the Holocaust, in 1961, as Silvana mentioned, he was in Jerusalem uh, and he attended part of the Eichmann trial. Um, and uh, he wrote a report on April 11th, 1961, from uh, Jerusalem about this. And I find it, in, you know, again, a very, very powerful piece of journalism. He, he reproduces that text in Il Mio Novecento. And of course, if you know Hannah Arendt's very well-known book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, The Banality of Evil, which was her um, series of articles for The New Yorker that was published in 1963, actually a year after Eichmann was executed, was hanged in, in, in Israel. Um, it's kind of amazing that this two pages is so brilliantly captures really the problem of Eichmann. Um, you know, he doesn't say, like uh, Hannah Arendt said, you know, he's banal, he seems like an ordinary guy following orders. He can see that he's hiding something, he's very twitchy. And uh, I put this photograph up because she noticed that when they said something, Eichmann would kind of nervously clutch and clench his fist all the time. Um, and that's actually, ca I've seen some of the films of the trial, and it's interesting that you get that kind of body language of somebody who's um, denying a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, then, again, I think I need to mention this, this very, very important reportage on international fascism, which came out in 1965 in Italian, and then there was the English edition, which came out in 1969. It's a big, big book. This is the English edition, Fascism Today. It's very chunky. Uh, it's a major piece of investigative journalism. It was 24 articles in the Gazette del Popolo that Del Bocca wrote, and then he expanded into the book with the collaboration of another writer, another journalist, Mario Giovanna. Um, and again, I don't want to say much about this, but I think clearly the timing is important. You know, why is he so interested in the continuity of fascism? Well, because fascism never went away in Italy. You know, it, it's a myth that it died in 1945 and somehow got reborn after 1992 and is now back in power. It never went away. 1960 was uh, a really important moment because of the Tambroni affair, uh, this attempt by the Christian Democrats to form a government with the support of the uh, the MSI, the Movimento Sociale Italiano, um, huge pub protests uh, in Geneva, which was an anti-fascist city. Um, people were killed in those protests. Uh, there were also protests in other cities. And, um, you know, this led to a, a sense that the 60s, which we tend to collectively remember as a time of radical change from the left, was also a time of growing fascism, um, in, in, and not only in Italy, but around the world. If the 60s open with Geneva, 19, you know, 1960, they close with 1969, uh, the bomb of Piazza Fontana. Um, planted by fascists, but of course with the complicity of people in the state, uh, the secret services, NATO, you know, that whole thing of the strategia della tensione that we know about. So it's a, it's a, a decade bookended by fascist violence. 
Um, and this is a, a, a great book. It really is, you know, it stood up pretty well, I think. Um, he, there are, there's a chapter on the international networks of fascism, how they all connect with each other, where the money flows, how the Nazis um, got to Argentina, who were the industrialists who funded that and paid for them to live there. But it also has these uh, individual chapters on different countries. There's one on Spain, Sweden, Argentina, um, Germany, Italy, France, Austria, Belgium, Portugal, Greece, Japan, uh, Africa and the USA. He talks about the John Birch Society, he talks about the Ku Klux Klan, uh, individual fascists like Edwin Walker and Robert Welch. Uh, and again, I thought I'd just read a passage from this. This is the end of his passage on the United States because, you know, this was written in 1965, but, you know, golly, is it not still relevant today? Uh, we must, however, this is talking about the United States, add that in a country where the military industrial technological complex is growing ever stronger and its ambitions greater with every day, the barriers raised against subversion are today being subjected to a heavier strain. And for the more thoughtful, sensitive Americans, it's becoming harder to believe with Herman Melville that they can remain the only bearers of the arc of liberty in the world. Um, then I'm coming to an end. I need to leave space for Ruth to talk. But I wanted just to say one, one other thing of these other books that he produces. You can see this kind of trio of books that came out in the early 60s. Um, two of them are about Africa. One is this really disturbing account of uh, white supremacism, racism in South Africa. It's really horrifying read, you know, learning, you know, how some, even from the taxi driver who takes him from the airport in Johannesburg to the hotel, and when she finds out he's a journalist, he said, oh, you're obviously one of these international liberals who are going to, you know, write uh, about how wonderful the kafir are. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And then it kind of gets worse after that. Um, the, the, the one I like really is La Traspaña. Um, it shows, I think, that this man who was really a lifelong socialist, I would say, he left the Socialist Party in 1980 because he hated Bettino Craxi. He said the party is going, moving to the right. It's not a party I recognise anymore. I'm the, I'm the sort of socialist of Pietro Nenni. I'm the socialist of Giacomo Matteotti. I don't really identify with these, with these suits anymore. Um, but he, he very much connected with international uh, opposition to. Um, dictatorship and that this visit to Spain in 1960 61 which of course is the time when the Franco regime is still very powerful and is torturing and imprisoning uh, the opposition is a, is a really very uh, extraordinary account of that of that moment you know he says how is it that the left in some ways has produced cultural things in the 1950s how come you get you know movies by Bardem which seem to be left-wing films in a, a repressive state. Well, there's a kind of degree of tolerance, but when these people start getting dangerous, when ETA starts and they start, you know, bombing, you know, trains or, you know, burning Franco flags, then they imprison them and they and they torture them. Um, and there's a very, very moving letter that he, open letter that he published in um, September 61. And I should actually mention here that how come he's writing all these radical things in a Christian Democrat funded newspaper? Because La Gazzetta del, Gazzetta del Popolo originally was owned by SIP, you know, Società Idiolettica Piemontese. It was, after 1945, was owned by a series of Christian Democrat industrialists. Well, the answer is the editors had all been partisans, like Del Boca. Um, there was a strong journalist union there. And they allowed the Tetsa Pagina to write, you know, these things. And they liked the fact he did these. And also it was good copy because it was beating La Stampa. La Stampa was very much more institutional. It was owned by Fiat. You know, you couldn't write these left-wing things. So this Christian Democrat paper allowed um, this, this writing to take place. And I think it's worth remembering, um, you know, that at a time when television was much more state-controlled, radio, and the Christian Democrats had a kind of grip on it in the 1960s, and there were newspapers, including ones ostensibly, you know, moderate, where this kind of radical journalism could come out. So in La Traspaña is one example. All these three books are. Um, and uh, the bit I really like is this letter, open letter he wrote to Julen Madariga, who was a, a leader of ETA, the founder of ETA, the Basque uh, liberation movement, who'd been arrested after a bomb attack on a train. He hadn't actually planted it himself, uh, attack on a train carrying ex phalanges to San Sebastian. They burnt some Franco flags. He was tortured uh, in the notorious prison of Carabanchel in Madrid. Uh, and uh, this is a brilliant, bitter um, letter about the indifference of Italians to what's going on to our comrades in Spain. Uh, and I find this perhaps a key to how he got so interested in international issues. Um, he said, you know, Torino now in 1960 
One is not the Torino I knew. You know, I hoped, like many who'd fought in the resistance, there'd been a radical transformation of Italian society. Torino's become a bourgeois city. You know, it's a consumerist city. Um, it's not a, a place of radicalism anymore. I'm finding that outside Italy. And, you know, I, I think in a way his, his interest in foreign travel and connecting with these radicals abroad and denouncing fascism abroad was all part of the same, you know, this, you know, we didn't get the Italy we wanted. I'm looking for it somewhere else. Um, that's pretty much it. I'm, I'm, I, he wrote, as I say, these two books, sorry, this book on John Ali and Creasy, which is a wonderful, I mean, I, I knew this actually a while ago when I was working on the sort of history of the media, uh, but it's not something I really want to talk about. I wanted just to focus on those more radical pieces of journalism. So that's the Angelo del Bocca giornalista, and Ruth, I think, now will talk about the Angelo del Bocca storico. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I learned so much from Silvana and David. I didn't actually uh, know um, the extent of the international reportage. Uh, I, I should definitely and have used, when I wrote my book Strongman, the, the uh, Fascism Today uh, book. So thank you for, for talking about all that. And I'm very, I'm very happy to be here. Um, to participate in a panel in honor of somebody I admire so much. And the fact I get to do it in front of my dear friends, Daniela Del Boca and Chris Flynn, and with dear colleagues is just a, a treat. Um, so uh, I'm going to narrow, narrow in again. And really, it's, it's no exaggeration to say that uh, the work of Angela Del Boca, starting in the 1960s, opened up an entire field of scholarship on Italian colonialism and made this possible. And Silvana talked about this a little, but to appreciate the impact it had, you really have to understand the deterrence that there were in Italy to writing about these things and speaking about them in a truthful way. And you know, Italy it starts with, you know, Italy lost its colonies in the context of this World War II defeat and the shame of this. It was lived as a shame and it wasn't spoken of, uh, coupled with the desire to escape responsibility for fascist war crimes, produced a kind of zone of silence regarding fascist colonial violence, exploitation, and a little bit the colonies themselves. This, like, this defeat, especially of the African empire that Mussolini had given them, it was like too much to take. And so Italy did not have any decolonization pro process. And that meant also, as Silvana mentioned, the colonial, this incredible situation, the colonial archives were controlled by these neo-colonial functionaries, people who had been in the colonial administration, and they had every interest in, in protecting themselves and protecting the way they saw uh, their work. And so they, you know, they only allowed people to consult who would turn out these approved narratives that either, as Silvana said, either you know, saw colonialism uh, Italy did good things in Africa, did the equivalent of Mussolini making the trains run on time at home. And of course, the myth of the bravo italiano, the, the benevolent dictatorship, um, or openly nostalgic for empire. <clears throat> because that's another thing, there was a huge nostalgia for the grandeur of fascism and the grandeur of empire. And you know, there, I, I wrote a book on um, the first the first book dedicated only to Italian um, uh, film propaganda, imperial-themed film propaganda. And there were remakes of many, many of these films made in the 1950s and 60s. And they, they did well. So people wanted to live in the empire again. And then there were all the exploitative postcards of native African women and records of imperial songs. All of this did business, this nostalgia culture. Now, of course, what was not remembered was the violence of the occupations, right? Uh, and of course, 
uh, I, I'm one of the few people who've actually seen the war crimes charges at the UN, the uh, UN War Crimes Commission. And the reason that no Italians could see those documents, they were, they were stored at the UN, is that you had to get the approval of your uh, the equivalent of your foreign minister. So I had the power at the time and then her successor, because I went twice. But no Italian was ever approved to work with these. Uh, these, are, these are work structures by France, by Yugoslavia, but also by Ethiopia. Um, so, so there was, they never came to, there was no Nuremberg, there was nothing, there was no decolonization, reckoning. And that's how the situations endured where the journalist, Andrew Montelli, could state, you know, in the 1990s, that uh, up through the 1990s, that Italy had used gas when there were lots of, of photographs of soldiers with bombs that had gas in them smiling and being proud because the fascists were actually very proud of their technological, their technological repression, including chemical warfare. They were proud of it. Indeed, um, when they had concentration camps in Libya that led to genocide, they actually made not only newsreels of these camps, but they made a big coffee table book uh, that was 100, 100 pages on these camps and how they were starving Bedouins and having math forced marches. This was a point of pride. So it wasn't a secret, <laughs> and yet it had to become a secret later, and you weren't supposed to write about it. So I'm emphasizing this because Del Boca started his work in a hostile climate, and he had, he was hassled. He, former colonial officials, like Alessandro Lesona, he tried to discredit him at the beginning, saying that, for saying that Italians, you know, used chemical warfare. The National Association of Veterans of the African War threatened him with lawsuits, and at one point told people to go and maybe beat him up, right? They said they could arrive at his, they should go to his house and, and you know, do something to him. And this is what he got for documenting what had actually happened in the colonies. So I think it's important to, to, to re recollect that environment. So as has been said, he was a journalist, and then he became a full-time, what we would call an independent scholar, independent historian. And it's that freedom from institutional constraints that allowed him to write the histories of things that most Italians didn't want to hear about. Had he been an academic, there, were, there was no support for doing colonial studies, colonial history at all in the academy, only from the point of view of military history. Um, and so the, his work in the archives and his writings were very, very important uh, as a source base because other people couldn't get into those archives, younger scholars, foreign scholars. And that's the same reason um, also the pioneering work done by the military historian Giorgio Rochat. He was able to get in military archives, but other people were not. Um, so so it, it, it made it possible, it really did. <clears throat> so to give a concrete sense of how difficult it was to work on colonialism, even in the 90s, I just want to tell a brief personal story of trying to work with the visual record, visual primary sources. So if you want to see today, because today it's very different, if you want to see uh, a luce, the official um, you know, documentary propaganda um, or institute, if you want to see one of their uh, things, you just go to the website, because it's been digitized, both the films and um, thousands upon thousands, probably 10, tens of thousands of still photos, so it's easy. But until the 2000s, it was not the case. So in the late 90s, I went to Luce, made an appointment to see this documentary, Il Camino delle Roy, the, the heroes, the path of the heroes. This was an official propaganda film. It was made for Italians to see, but also for export. It had French and German subtitles. It was like the official propaganda record of the Ethiopian war. So when I told the woman in charge, the funzionario di sala, what I wanted to see, she got extremely nervous 
And at the time, um, there was this thing called the moviola. It's like, that's how it had reels, and it's a machine where you, you have a lever and you operate, that's how you see the film. So she announced that she was going to operate it for me. So she, I, sat, I was sitting, and here's the moviola, and she was behind me, and so she would, she, when, I, when it was like footage of Italians being uh, brava gente, like inoculating babies, she would slow it down. When it was anything like battle scenes, she would speed it up. She'd say, ma non è di interesse. <laughs> so it's as though, this was censorship. It was as though she was reading, you know, I was trying to read a book, and she's like turning the pages for me. That was the level of anxiety. And at least I got to see it. On that same trip, uh, a much more progressive-minded archivist at, this, at the photo archive, he actually, I said, I want to see some photos. So he went and got a crowbar. This is very symbolic of how things were. He had to, there was a rusted box, huge rusted box. He said, I don't think anybody's ever opened these like for decades. So he had to find a crowbar and we, we got it open and these, there were, there were you know, uh, battlefield photos and some atrocity photos. But that's what you had to do. <laughs> so so this, that, that was the situation in the 90s. And he's starting to write about this in the 60s. So the range of his writing and the fact that he wrote for the public is why he had such a big impact. And the book that, um, I don't remember if it's Silvana or David showed a picture of the first book that he did in the 60s on the Ethiopian War. It first appeared as installments in the Gazeta del Popolo. And that's very important. It was very unusual. And that's where he started talking. This was his big sin. He started talking about chemical warfare and gas as early as the 60s in Gazeta del Popolo. So, so he carried on this activity and this um, denunciation. And only in the 1990s did the Italian state and Montanelli finally admit that they had used gas. It took them till the mid-90s. So he edited a book that appeared that year. And I remember it was like a big deal. I, went, I was in Italy, and I like rushed to buy this book. I still have it in my office here, I Gas di Mussolini. And it was different essays about all the, uh, you know, all the colonial, colonial violence and many, many essays about the effect of gas, because there were hundreds of tons of gas used. And the reason they used the gas is that they they couldn't, they were afraid, they were traumatized by Adwa from the 1890s when they were, you know, uh, defeated by the Ethiopians and they wanted to make sure that they would just do, fight in a way that they would have a quick victory. So he opened up again this new chapter in the study of colonial violence and starting in the 90s, and he continued it. He has a book in 2005 called Italiani Brava Gente, which he was in his 80s when he wrote it, and that was a more general account of repressive moments in Italian history. So just quickly, I want to talk about Libya. He did a huge amount of work on Italian uh, occupation Libya. Libya. Um, he did a magisterial two-volume study, the Italiani in Libya, which was about the experiences of Italians, uh, the, you know, the policies. And Libya is, is, was very understudied. There was also reasons on the Libyan side why. Um, it was difficult to get sources. Then Gaddafi started this enormous uh, oral history project, but um, he had a very particular nationalist historiography. So, so studying collaboration and stuff was very difficult from the Libyan side, too. But Libya was the site of genocide. And still, nobody knows about this. In 1930-31, because they, you know, they had, they had had uh, parts of Libya since 1912, but they were not able to conquer the, the interior. And Cyrenaica was the area that was worse. So they they built an enormous wall between Egypt and Libya to stop uh, people helping the resistance. And they uh, took all the nomadic and semi-nomadic peoples, the Bedouin, 
who were helping the resistance, accused of helping the resistance. They did a huge forest march. They built concentration camps in the middle of the desert, and they put them there. And tens of thousands of them died of starvation. And, and rightly, the Libyan government has always seen this as genocide. But nobody knows about this genocide, and it was before Ethiopia, right? So it's a very charged place, uh, Libya, in that way. And um, <clears throat> by the time the 30 years of Italian occupation ended, Libyans had a 40% infant mortality rate and 90% illiteracy rate. One third of the population perished, and 14,000 Libyans went into exile. That was the toll of Italian colonialism. So just to conclude, as we heard, he was a partisan in the resistance. And in the 2000s, the mid-2000s, he got a chance to do a project which really united his, and now we've seen from David, this, uh, this interest in you know, resistance and anti-fascism. Um, the grandson of an important Libyan resistance leader, Mohamed uh, Fekini, came to Del Boca with his grandfather's memoir and hundreds of letters, including letters with Graziani, who was the fascist general known as the Butcher, for his ruthless repression. And so these became the basis of this book, which was called Un, Un Paso dalla Forca, or it was translated into English, and I, I'm very honored to write the introduction. Mohamed Fekini and the Fight to Free Libya. And it was the first time that these letters of a major resistor were placed in the public domain. And it was, for me, it was I used, I used the material in Strongman. Um, it was very important to have this Libyan, these intimate documents of Libyan point of view of the resistor. And really, like the book, this book, like all of his work, it really testifies to his enormous humanity. And we see this from all of the battles he was fighting that, uh, in various parts of society. So he ends this book. It's a very personal book, in a way, uh, with a long poem in honor of Libyans who died under the occupation. So I'll read, just, uh, I'll read the last stanza. Let us think of the 100,000 dead that Libya sacrificed to regain her freedom, 60,000 in war, 40,000 behind the barbed wire of the camps. And I was thinking this is the, this theme of camps and imprisonment, right, and lagers, right, that definitely connects to his Libya research. 100,000 dead, we can quickly add up the total. One Libyan out of every eight gave their life for their homeland. So really, for four, over 40 years, Del Boca, he was a testimony scomodo, but he was the conscience of his country in a way. He was shining a light on all the things that Italians didn't want to think about um, and showing the spaces where tyranny was um, you know, continuing. And really, his tenacity in doing this, again, for over four decades, is one of the many things that make him so admirable and really quite unique. So thank you. Silvana, David, and Daniela, please to come today. Uh, Julian, do you mind lowering the light a little bit? <laughs> Unless they also give us a 10. And Daniela Del Boca at the beginning told me that she wouldn't want to say anything, but <laughs> if I told her, if I asked her a question, she would have to answer. And I wanted to know something personal. You, you lived with him, you 
were raised by, by Angelo del Boca. You decided not to become a historian. And I wanted to ask you what it was like. I mean, the fact that his research and his articles were, were so shocking and so uh, controversial when they came out, and he really had enemies, and he really had people that promised to do harm to him and his family. What was it like to witness that from the inside of his family? Okay. First of all, I want to thank uh, Stefano for organizing this fantastic uh, moment uh, um, and all the speaker for saying very important thing about my father's work. And especially I want to say that uh, what I really appreciate is that they found uh, a thread between uh, all the uh, life of my father being a partisan when he was very young, and then becoming a journalist, and being always a writer, and then becoming an historian. So I want to say that this is really an important thread. And this responding to, uh, to Stefano's question, uh, when we, we were three children, we didn't see my father, <laughs> because he was all over, as, uh, as uh, David was describing. He was in Africa, he was in Iran, he was in India. He was coming back at some point with incredible stories that, of course, stay in our mind. And I could tell you many of them because I remember names and things. Uh, then we became uh, adolescent and we realized more of the important message that my father is trying to convey about trying another history, try to write another history more, with more truth, uh, uh, in which he put a lot of courage. And um, you mentioned the book L'Altra Spagna. So L'Altra Spagna uh, was a moment, for example, in which uh, uh, my father was in contact with many Spaniards, the, many Spaniards in the resistance. This is probably the most vivid thing. Um, and uh, we were in danger many times. So, so sometime uh, my mother was sending us away because there was a package arriving to the house and we didn't know what it was. And then there were important people that were like uh, involved in the resistance in Spain or involved in other, in other uh, in scaring uh, situation. So, um, so we were very, uh, especially since we were adolescent, we became very aware and uh, of the fact that my father was very courageous and he was not afraid of anything. And uh, so that was the big uh, legacy. Thank you. Do we have any question uh, from the audience? Yes. Sure. Uh, can you wait for the microphone so your, your voice is going to be recorded? Thank you. Just a couple of things. One is I went back and read the book after about 15 years, and I was amazed by the fantastic opening chapter, which basically covers various efforts to define what it is to be Italian. So, I mean, I remember all the gory details of Libya and Ethiopia, but I'd forgotten this, so I really recommend whoever read the book a long time ago to go back and read that. But my question is, has this set off any research on uh, how Italians were during World War II in the Balkans, specifically in Bosnia, where some anecdotal positive things, where people were running away from the Nazi zone into the Italian zone, or in Albania, where people seem to generally have a positive opinion of Italy? Has it set off any subsequent work? I mean, the former Yugoslav archives should be open for people who have those kind of language skills. So I guess this is a question mostly for the historians. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did raise this first. I mean, uh, I'm, you can I'm, say something in the uh, Yes, I mean, it has opened up research on this. Um, uh, you know, there was a, this BBC film that came out, I can't remember the date of it now, uh, called, what's it called? Fascist? Uh, Legacy. Fascist Legacy. Mm -hmm. Which you know talked about Rwanda and the sort of the, the you know the 89. sorry 89 the massacres in uh, in um, in uh, in the Balkans uh, and um, yeah there has been a number of important work I mean Eric Corbetti is sort of person who comes to mind but I think there's a number of other people who've started now David Romney are doing sort of serious ar archival work yeah and there was you know sort of major uh, violence there in in fact. Um, uh, Ian Campbell, who's the person who did the work, a you know, really good British historian who's lived in Ethiopia for a long time, did the work on the uh, Addis Ababa massacre of 37, and he's done the work on the Libra, Libanus massacre. When I sent him a copy of my book, uh, Misaji Disangwe, he said, 
why isn't there a chapter about uh, what they did in the Balkans? You know, that's such a major piece of, uh, you know, so it's a question. And, you know, um, there's a very interesting history where uh, people who, there were people who served in Libya, uh, helping with the genocide and repression, and then there were, and then they went to Ethiopia, and some of those ended up in the Balkans. And the Italian concentration camps, uh, and this is, these, are, these are some of the war crimes uh, things also I was able to see. Um, the concentration camps the Italians had uh, were, you know, there were people who had escaped uh, from Nazi loggers and they said these are just as bad. Um, but there was, a, there was a learning curve for repression that was um, done in the colonies, and then they went to the Balkans. Um, and so the, the, colonial, the colonial violence is very central to all kinds of war crimes, and that's why uh, people didn't want it to be talked about or known, even. So. Can I just ask a follow-up? Because Mr. Martin said it's... Can you see the way just a quick follow-up is, is there a similar discouragement now? You see so many books about the Foybe, you go to Trieste, you see people complaining about being kicked out of Pola, but you don't see the other side, the, the Slovenian side, so much. Even in Istria, you don't see books about this, right? So is there some informal discouragement about talking about this for acad academics? Yeah, no, I, I, I would like to address because it, it, exactly as we were talking about the Balkans, immediately uh, the uh, whole issue of the Foybe comes up, and that's a big issue for, a big issue, a big, um, let's say, theme that the right wing likes to uh, stress, right, in order to uh, show the image of the Italians as victims uh, and decontextualize uh, completely, right, those events. So... Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, let's say, part of the revisionism uh, that has taken place uh, uh, from the, uh, essentially, since the end of the anti-fascist consensus in Italy that started in the 1990s when Berlusconi brought uh, the neo-fascist into the government. Uh, and so, the, let's say, they have a whole series of themes uh, that they like to uh, bring up, uh, and this is one of, of them, and they uh, had to dedicate uh, Right, they are the ones who push the um, creation of a day of remembrance, uh, Il Giorno del Ricordo, right, for the victims of the Foibe, which is again a completely de decontextualized case because the fascists had been uh, violently imposing their own rule in the Balkans, and the Foibe was the result eventually of that, right? It was not just an event that happened in a vacuum. I, I keep, while I was preparing this, I keep thinking, what on, well, I kind of know, but what would he have thought about Meloni and the horror show of, because um, she is a neo-fascist, um, and she is a highly militant person, and a lot, I've done a lot of analysis of her ministers and Soto Segretari. There's a huge amount of people who were neo-fascists who are in her government. Even the, the people who are, quote, moderates, like her minister of finance, was a neo-fascist. So I keep thinking, what on earth would he, <laughs> what would he, th we can kind of guess, but it's, uh, it's quite something, right? But I think it goes even beyond what we saw in the 90s, because in the 90s they were a minority party in the majority. And the majority was Berlusconi, which was very corrupt, but... Um, didn't have this kind of linkage, historical linkage. While we now have the reversal of that situation in which the party which has a, a precise historical linkage to neo-fascism, which has its precise historical linkage to the Republic of Salah, has uh, the relative majority. And so, so that's the situation. So, uh, as we say in Italy, non c'è mai fine al peggio. There's no end to the worst of things. Does it have to do, I have a question for all of you. Does it have to do with the... Thank you.
My name is uh, Angelo Cagliotti, and um, I work in the history of Italian colonialism. And so I just wanted to sh make a short reflection and ask a question to Daniela. In particular, I just want to say that despite the great number of works that follow Del Boca, his uh, six volumes on Italian colonialism are still an unparalleled source of information. And uh, every time, even if I read them multiple times, every time I open them, there's always something that I learn. <laughs> Um, just in terms of the detail of uh, archival work that he did. And I think historiographically, um, even if he's, uh, as, as you all pointed out, and I really enjoyed all the presentations, uh, a lot of we remember, especially his work against uh, fascism. But um, for me, historiographically, what he really contributed was the, the idea of uh, Italian colonialism being something that preceded and even followed fascism. And as uh, uh, Professor Forges says, uh, the fact that fascism ne never went away, right? The fact that this, ex this continuity that he highlighted between the liberal, the fascist, and even the post-war period. And so I guess my question was, as you pointed out, how his work was very brave. Where did he find, what do you think was the source of his uh, courage, in a sense? Because obviously he was uh, an exceptional historian um, that, in terms of its ethical, sort of moral strength. Where do you think, uh, where did it come from in a sense? Thank you. Um, I don't know exactly, but uh, <clears throat> my father was very courageous and uh, um, even when there was, uh, he was writing in the situation that, uh, that Ruth described uh, in which he was attacked by many people uh, around him, his colleague, uh, his, people in the academics, um, he didn't really mind and he continues his battle for the truth. And uh, the, what I'm really happy is that I realized that in spite of the fact that he was not, uh, uh, he was not academically recognized, I mean, he was academically recognized, but he was not part of the academic, he had several, several students, so several people are following what he did, and uh, and uh, and I, some of them I met them after my father's death, uh, but uh, they continue his legacy. So is. Uh... Hi everyone. My name is Eden Gabrisellassi. I was born and raised in Italy to parents from Eritrea in East Africa, which was. Um, connected to Ethiopia throughout the colonialism of Italy. So one, thank you so much. I learned a lot from Angelo Del Boca. And I think I have two questions. One is fascism was side by side with the atrocity the Nazis did. And so as much as I tried to learn about it and educate myself, I still don't understand how is it that it was not denounced from either the United Nations or all the different international organizations and uh, nations of the world um, to, you know, rebuke, you know, fascism and not just kill Mussolini publicly. Um, so that's the first question. And then the second question is with so many uh, factual uh you know, literacy pieces like Angelo del Boca, and even now through, you know, thanks to social media and digital media, there are so many artifacts or proofs of what fascism did, right? Like when you speak about, um, I can never remember his last name, you mentioned it a few times, Ennio, no, the, the one that was denying the gas. Oh, Montanelli. Uh, Montanelli, yes. So not only he was, you know, uh, pro um, fascism, but you know, he w there is a big video that often goes viral about him defending pedophilia mm -hmm. and kind of showing off how um, he was gifted young brides of the age of 12 and 13 years old, and the woman that actually speaks to him is actually uh, a uh, woman that is half Italian and half Ethiopian. Um, so my question is this, with all these facts that you can now, uh, you, you don't have to get a permission from, you know, like a minister, uh, and you can find it online, 
there is this continuous resurgence of fascism, uh, and now it's part of our government. Before, when I was growing up in Italy, you would go to a restaurant and there would be a bust of Mussolini uh, just staring at you as you're eating, or you know, people talking about how great it was, you know, having Mussolini during that time. And now we have a full-on fascist government, and me being. Uh, bicultural, bilingual, etc. from Italy now living in America, as we're living in fear growing up in Italy, right? Like this, this is not just, oh, I can't believe like we're here, we're actually living in fear, people are dying, there is no either media or, you know, political consequence to what these people are doing. So, you know, I know that it's long-winded, but my question is with all these facts and why the UN didn't do anything and how have we gotten here at this point? Thank you. David. Um, yeah, it's, this is a kind of complicated bit of history. I'll try and give a short version of it. Um, and the reason there was no war crimes trial of what the, these people had done in Ethiopia, that's Pietro Badoglio, um, Rodolfo Graziani, Maletti, uh, Guido Cortese. They were all named by the Ethiopian government. They compiled a dossier with testimonies of people who'd been who witnessed the 1937 massacre, it was clear that there was a lot of evidence. Um, this didn't come to, there was no war crimes tribunal for Ethiopia for a number of reasons. Uh, one was that Badoglio was the transitional head of state, as head, head of government after Mussolini, and the British and the Americans had to kind of work with him. Um, and then after the war, it would have been you know, considered to be politically inexpedient to um, move against him. Um, Graziani was put on trial, but not for what he'd done in Libya or Ethiopia. He was put on trial for being Minister of War in the Republic of Salo, um, you know, conscripting young men, uh, yeah, shooting people who refused to, to fight. Um, and he got off. He was tried by military tribunal. He was given 17 years sentence. He actually served, I think, two, two years. He let off. He was then made honorary president of the Movimento Sociale, and he died in, his, uh, his, his, um, in Afile where they then later erected a monument to, to him. Uh, so the, the kind of the whitewashing of this, the cover-up of this was to do, I think, with you know, the, the Cold War, the beginnings of you know, new kind of realignment in Europe, um, the fact that Ethiopia was not considered to be, it wasn't part of the European theater of war, and these were black people who were, who were massacred. Uh, you put all that together, it just didn't fit uh, the model of a war crimes tribunal. Uh, and of course it happened, you know, these massacres happened before the official start of World War II in 39. That's the other reason. So it wasn't actually part of the world, uh, world War Two. Want to add to that? There was another question. So the question, the, the question. No, no, she had yeah. Well, the last, the the last comments. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why don't you ask the second part? Of the second part. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. You, you, you do, oh, do you want to say something about the second? The second part of the question is the question that we all have. We all ask ourselves, right? Yeah. About uh, right. Why? Why is it? Oh, yeah. So why is it that fascism is still so popular in Italy? I mean, this is the big question that we have to ask. And I would say, in part, uh, you know, you can be explained just with the past 30 years, what has happened in the past 30 years, in which fascism has been banalized and it's been, uh, you know, a, a whole story is about also the equivalence between uh, the, the partisans and those who fought for the uh, Republic of Salon has been uh, sort of revived, right, and, and placed uh, in, uh, um, you know, has given a, a bigger emphasis uh, in the public discourse because, uh, again, the heirs of fascism are in have been in government for quite a while, so they've been trying to rewrite history. But even before that, in any case, uh, right, a, a kind of uh, whitewashing of fascism started already right after the war, right? We talked about the nostalgia. There was not only nostalgia, for the colony, there was nostalgia for the regime itself. And there is, let's say, a whole group of people who are conservative, who don't mind voting for, for these people, clearly. So as we can see how they move easily, you know, if they are discontented, they move from one party to, the, to another that can guarantee a certain kind of uh, continuity of rule, right, on the right. So, I mean, this, this would be, we, we could talk about this, quite a while, but it's been uh, clearly, since the fall of the, um, of the wall, things have changed, even though fascism were there before, but um, uh, the resistance is no longer as strong as it, as it used to be. 
I just wanted to make some comments. This should be our last year. Isn't it true that after the war, de Gasperi, who was then the president, came to the United States and asked for aid? And he was told that he would be given aid if, if he did not allow the communists and the socialists to be in the government? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So. It was, yeah, he was prime minister. And what? He was the prime minister. He was the president. Yeah. And I think Del Boca would be very upset and, uh, because of what happened in Libya, where uh, in Libya, as far as I know, they had a very strong social service program, uh, universal health care. Women went to the university. Yet Hillary Clinton gave the okay to bomb that country. Well, but it was a, it was a horrible dictatorship. But that was for the people to decide. And not well, to they didn't have any way to decide because it was. A, a, they didn't have a way to decide because Gaddafi was there for 42 years, and he, the reason there were, that uh, there was a civil war is that people rebelled. They couldn't stand in it anymore. Um, it was a kleptocracy. He stole hundreds of billions of dollars from the Libyan people. Early on, when he first came. He did, he had women, he wanted women to be educated. He wanted to make up for the deprivation of colonialism. But that was a long, that was very early. He was there for 42 years. And he was, a, he was one of the most repressive rulers in the world and one of the most uh, thieving rulers in the world. So uh, when the reason he's not there and he, he was killed is that this is what happens to awful dictators. So I don't think... Too many, yeah. All right. I think it would really be helpful and interesting if CASA would have a forum about the concept that fascism never went away. I, I read mm -hmm. that while the major fascist leaders were jailed or whatever, but there are plenty of mid-level fascist judges mm -hmm. uh, lawyers, that kind of thing, and that the partisans were actually punished and, and were not allowed to have decent jobs and were even jailed. So this is a very frightening and troubling situation. And I'm just thinking that it, people might be really interested in that kind of topic. Well, been talking about little else since September 25th. <laughs> but, you know, we have been talking about this, perhaps not here so much, but it's yeah, it is the kind of theme of the moment, really. And I would say that we have not had a specific forum, that, but it's a recurrent theme in all our programs having to do with fascism. This idea that Italy did not come to terms with its fascist past, and any initiative that we did for the Day of Memory, uh, and, and many other things, of course, that had uh, Ruth as protagonist, or, or Silvano also, and David, have that as a center. And you know, Italy didn't have a Nuremberg. The closest thing to Nuremberg was Angelo del Boca. But it, you know, it was a one-man tribunal court and everything. Nuremberg was some sort of uh, purifying moment for all of Germany, and Italy didn't have that. And you're totally right that some of the uh, high-ranking, the highest-ranking officers were under trial. But you know, we heard what happened to Graziani. That there was a criminal, if there ever was one, it was him, with a few months in jail, and he was out, and revered and respected and, and everything else. Um, we know also the political reasons for that. You know, Togliatti passed the amnesty, uh, and you know, did he have a choice? Could he do different from what he did? Uh, and it, it's interesting to see how different countries deal with the moment of apuration, of what do you do with the people that collaborated and in what way. The French apparently have been some of the most radical ones in, in, the, in the apuration process. Um, the Spaniards didn't have an apuration process at all because they transitioned lightly uh, between one regime and the other. And Italy is some sort of in between. Uh, but definitely the, the ranks of the, of the judiciary, for example, that you, as you mentioned, uh, were not uh, purged unless there were exceptional cases of egregious cases of miscarriage of justice, they didn't go to revise all the trial and all the administrative procedures. So it is a past that is still haunting us.
And I think the discussion, the conversation that we had after, in which we talked about today, I think that's also a great homage to Adel Boca, that he was talking about the history of the past, but he was also saying something very relevant to the history of his time. And I think the fact that our conversation was led into the direction of today is also speaks greatly of Angelo Del Boca's legacy. So thank you very much for all of you who are here and to our speakers and to Daniela Del Boca. Thank you.